Eat more Rangers. <laughs> Dude, you know, I, I'm behind. You got to get it. I know. I know. It. <laughs> and uh, I think I'm going to wear it while we're on the show here. Oh, hell yeah. My WWE title belt, man. How's that? <laughs> what do you think, oh, brother? Oh, check that Dude. thing out. Where'd you get that? Yeah. So, uh, um, Triple H gave and uh, Vince McMahon gave this to me when I spoke at the uh, uh, tribute to the troops in the Verizon Center. 12,000 troops there for a WWE event, and I had to get up on stage. You can find it on YouTube if anybody in the audience wants to look at it. And oh. it was the most nervous I've ever been in my life, brother. I got all these dang wrestlers backstage, you know, all the WWE stars, Roman Reigns, and all these guys. And they're getting ready to have me come out. And I came out, man, and, uh, you know, just fired up the crowd, you know. So, uh, Love that. so are, are you, I'm, I'm you just still all the hey, now, are, nothing in life is free, you know. They gave it to me, but the government charged me $300 for this freaking title belt, man. Can you do. believe that shit? I can't. Yeah. I can't. I can't. You know what? I had a great idea, though. You know, I don't know if you've seen where, the, where uh, well, like, yeah, Triple H, and he's taking the beer cans and he's smashing them in the face and, and just chugging them. We need to get a cup. We need to can a couple of the uh, uh, of the E Tool beer that's coming up this summer and, and send it to him and have him crack it open and do a do do the challenge. <laughs> what do you oh, say? I'm with you, man. Yeah, you know, but there. So, so, brother, how was your week, man? You no, know, it was good. Uh, my week was great. The weekend was 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 even better. Uh, you know, rolled into uh, you know making tacos and happy hour, of course, as you know. Um, and uh, you, you know, even with all this, the the stay at home kind of stuff, I've, I've just found uh, you know the weekend finding stuff to do and being creative. Uh, it's been it's it's been good. Uh, the week is 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 going. Really well, uh, VLG. We're we're you know firing all cylinders over there. Um, uh, you know with we fries and, and, and different classes and, and stuff like that. So we're on we're on yeah. fire. I, what's what's going on in your corner this week? Uh, same same brother. Just staying after it. You know, getting after PT. You know, I got called out this week for the you know the veteran suicide awareness challenge. I did. Uh, I by a bunch of Michael Craig, <laughs> and I called you out. Dude, I know. so you owe me, I got you. All right? I do. I owe you. you. Know? So, um, I, I, you know, being you, you being a trigger puller, brother, I would, I would expect you to take your AR and do some iron mites or something. Twenty-two <laughs> iron mites, man. You know, and I, and so I would ask the audience. You know, Ron O'Farrell, I called him out on the the Veteran Suicide Awareness Challenge. Tell us what you think Ron should do. Twenty-two of being this hardened Airborne Ranger. This war fighter and everything. <laughs> what do you have to do? You know. But anyways, oh, it's for a good cause, sure. brother. As you and I talk all the time about, uh, you know, suicide awareness and dealing with post traumatic stress disorder and and TBI and everything. And so I just want to continue to do the things that you know you and I are focused on in terms of bringing awareness and making sure. You know, I had an opportunity to talk to a good friend of mine that was feeling bad today. The PTSD was starting to get a hold of him, yeah. and uh, he's a big guy. And he put a post on Facebook, so I called his ass. And That's I told him, great. I said, look, brother, you ain't in this alone. We'll fight the demons together, and uh, and we'll get through this together, man. So that's kind of what I've done, you know. And, uh, you know, Sandra and I just enjoying time together and everything, man. That's great. That's great. The karaoke machine, did you wipe the dust off of it, or does it not have any time to collect any dust? Where are we at with that? Never has time to collect dust, brother. You know the deal, man. We're You know, we're going to continue to get after that, man. That's you know, if if you gotta you gotta stay at home uh, policy that you gotta adhere to, as long as you got beer, you got uh, a karaoke machine, you know, and a place to pass out at, you're you're generally in good shape. You know what I mean? <laughs> you're, you're in great shape. They're, you're in great shape. Yeah. Last I checked, you got a lot of real estate for for somebody to pass out at. Oh yeah, absolutely, <laughs> man. When this is all, when we're on the backside of this thing, we're gonna we're gonna wear it out, man. Yeah, yeah. Hey, oh, yeah. What kind of show do we got this week, man? We have a great show. You know, we, we put the vi little video out and stuff like that, but we have, uh, you know, two powerhouses. I think, you know, if the audience doesn't know. So what we do at the end of each show, uh, basically the next morning for AAR is we talk about what's going on for the next show. And usually, you know, John will pick someone. I'll pick someone back and forth. And we thought, you know what? John has someone great. I have someone great. So we have none other than Colton Smith, right? 
the uh, Ultimate Fighter Champion 16 live, and we've got. And this one, I got my yeah. title belt, and because uh, I know that dude has an Ultimate Fighter Season 16 title belt, and uh, he had to go out and earn his. All I had to do was get up and talk shit, and Vince <laughs> and, and, and Hunter Hearst Helmsley Triple H gave me this title belt. So where's that? Where, where's your stuff at, Colton Smith? You want to you want to show off something? It's uh, it's too heavy to put on the wall or wear, but let me. Uh, <laughs> here's my UFC Ultimate Fighter Championship gloves, and uh, there's the the lead crystal plaque right there. So, there she is in all oh, wow. glory. That's awesome. Uh, generally, hey, and then we got Ron. We got this guy over here. We got this guy over here that looks like he is either. Taco Bowman, you know, the president of the Outlaws Motorcycle Gang or a retired porn star, but we know him as Griff, man. We know Tell him us about Griff. Griff. None other than Griff, my, 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 my brother from another mother, uh, my ranger buddy, my, uh, my mentor, my confidant. He's, uh, he's a lot of things, but. Uh, you're going to tell him you're, what you're you really Griff. call me? <laughs> he's got all this stuff to tell you, baby. No, yeah, you're going to tell uh, him what you really call me? What's that? What you really call me? Uh, you know, okay. I call him my tall, my tall vanilla bean or chata. <laughs> <laughs> He's my cinnamon kumquat. <laughs> you know, two. That's why two. <laughs> well, welcome. Uh, and Griff is, uh, you know, for uh, West Point grad, uh, uh, two seven five Ranger veteran, as well as the uh, CEO and co-founder of Combat Flip Flops. So uh, glad to have you all both you both on the show today. Yeah, glad to be here. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I appreciate it. And I've been looking forward to this all week. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Ron, the theme of our show is, uh, you know, working our way through transition. And, you know, uh, Griff is going to share with us his experiences. Colton, you know, I guess I'll start with him. You know, uh, Colton is a an, an NCO in the United States Army. He's on active duty. He's an Airborne Ranger. Uh, he's doing a lot of great things for our country right now. Actually, I'm surprised that he's still in the country right now and that, that he's not off, uh, you know, dropping bombs or shooting ISIS in the face or beating him to death with an entrenching tool, you know. But uh, he's also a professional fighter. As you said, he won the Ultimate Fighter Season 16. And if you want to check that out, go to UFC Fight Pass. You can watch the entire season and watch how Colton ended up becoming a champion through that. Um, he's also an entrepreneur. He owns the Enlisted Nine Fight Company in the Enlisted Nine Fight Company Jiu-Jitsu Gym in Virginia. But uh, more than that, he's a husband, he's a father, and uh, he's just a consummate professional. So, Colton, uh, the first question I have for you is, as you are continuing, you know, this was like, what, 13 years ago you started thinking about fighting? Tell us how you got into that, man. You're in Iraq, if I remember right. You're in Iraq fighting combat operations, and how did you decide that you also wanted to branch out and be a professional mixed martial artist? So I was in, uh, I was in Baghdad, Western, Western Baghdad in Ghazalia, Al-Shula province, and, uh, you know, uh, we lived out in the economy, lived in a, in a house, three houses with borders around them with Iraqi National Police and some SWAT guys, and uh, to, to kill time anytime we were, were not on patrol or not QRF or not pulling Force Pro on our little, little combat outpost. Uh, I found a punching bag from the local market and some uh, some some pirated DVDs. So Dana White, please don't come after me. I got <laughs> UFC one to forty three DVDs and I started watching them on my little portable DVD player. This is during the surge. This is 06, you know, 07, 07 time frame. And I started watching these DVDs. And I'm like, I wrestled. I could fight. I could do this. You know, started grabbing the national, the Iraqi national police guys, wrestling them in the front yard, or some of my guys wrestling in the front yard. And I got. You know, kind of got hooked on it, and I told my platoon, I'm like, listen, guys, I'm telling you right now, UFC 150, Colton Smith, I'm going to be in it. You know, they laughed at me and looked at me like I was, you know, ridiculous. And uh, every day that I had an opportunity to, I'd, I'd get out in that front yard, and I'd try to test those moves I saw on the DVD that night. And that uh, kind of came to fruition, came back from Iraq, that deployment. We lost a lot of guys. Uh, I got them tattooed on my chest, actually. We lost 10 guys in that deployment. Um and uh, when I got back, six days after getting back, I was out on leave, and I was at a weigh-in for a fight in Winchester, Virginia. And uh, lo and behold, someone didn't go for, for, for the fight. You know, I'd been watching UFC, so why not put me in there? So they called out to the crowd and said, hey, you know, who wants to fight? You know, and I was drinking. 
I was a little inebriated, to be honest with you. And my dad looks at me and said, what about you, man? I'm like, yeah, I fight, raise my hand, you know. And Fernando Yamasaki, Mario Yamasaki's brother, was the promoter. And he's like, you fight? You know, everyone turns and looks, gets quiet. And then I'm like, yeah, I fight. Step up there, weigh in. Next day, man, I sober up and I'm, I'm nervous. I look the guy up on MySpace and I'm like, oh, man, this dude can scrap. Like, oh, my God, MySpace. You know, it, it aged myself. But uh, watching the guy on MySpace, like, this kid can actually scrap. I just – you know, wrestled Iraqis in the front yard. You had to find, it was a little late to turn it into a spelling bee, right? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, once I sobered up and I started, you know, watching the guy's videos, I'm like, this dude's been training his whole life. His name is Rob Wine, still a friend of mine to this day. Uh, luckily I knocked him out in the first round, 50, 54 seconds, the first round and knocked him out. Um, and if I wouldn't have won that fight, I probably would have thrown in the towel on my mixed martial arts career and would have never pursued it. But from that point forward, though, uh, to be honest with you, you know, once I got back from from leave and I, you know, told them I fought, they're like, what do you mean you fought? You got to ask permission for that kind of stuff in the military, uh, ask for forgiveness rather. And uh, I started training every day at lunch. You know, anytime I, I could get off work, I'd train until, you know, the guy at the, the local gym would kick me out. I was hooked. And I knew at that point I wanted to be in the UFC uh, and, and, you know, lo and behold, I was in UFC 160 against Robert Whitaker, the middleweight, former middleweight champion in the world. But I won the ultimate fighter around UFC 150, 155. So, honestly, my, my prophecy wasn't too far off. Awesome. Ron, That's, what can you tell us about the Griff here, man? Well, you know, I, mean, I think I, I'm going to start I, getting my facial hair looking like Griff's because – He's right? got that thing going. It looks good, man. My name is Griff, and I approve of this message. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I can't say anything that Griff can say. I mean, I mean, uh, he, he does. He probably does a better job at it than I do. Griff, where are you? You know, give give the honest little background of uh, where you're from, where, where you've been, and where you're at, where you're headed. Well, it's oddly enough, uh, there's three Iowa guys on the on the on the call here today. All of us. <laughs> That's right. Right. Two uh, city guys. Yeah, you know, actually, one, from we, Newport, one from Eldridge, and then we got that, you know, shithead from Ankeny. I don't, Ankeny, don't know what the hell, right. how we got here. <laughs> right, it's, it's a great place to be from, right? You look at it, all three of us are here. It seems to be working out for us. That's yeah, right. but, absolutely. Uh, I was, you know, I was, uh, yeah, I'm an Iowa guy, uh, learned how to work hard uh, there. Um, parents just said, hey, we're not paying for your college, so you can either get a scholarship or join the Army. Um, so I did both and went to West Point. Um, uh, fell in love with jumping out of airplanes and shooting big guns. And so I ended up, uh, going to be a fire support officer at the Ranger regiment, which is like the best job in the world. Um, get to play with all the big boy toys and did a uh, three deployments to Afghanistan, one to Iraq. Uh, I got out in 2006. Uh, my wife was in the military too. We had two kids and we just got out and I did what most guys did. And they just took the first job offered to them. So I built houses, uh, during the boom. Uh, until the until the crash happened in 2008 and I completely shifted gears I went to work for a company called remote medical international uh, as the military sales director and if you're in the regiment and you're the fire support officer which also means you're the headquarters platoon leader which means you have the the medics that you're responsible for and so just being around the medics enough I picked up on enough lingo to fake my way into this job and I managed a, a multi-million dollar program for an international company selling high-end medical rescue and training and equipment and doctors all over the world. Um, and through that, I, I ended up traveling to a whole bunch of different uh, conflict areas. And what I saw was small businesses were the, really the thing that were providing local security. It was the local business owner that was kicking all the shitheads off the street, right? And if you looked where all the bombs were not happening, it was were happening where business was going. So the idea just kept punching me in the face wherever I went. Um, that we need to have more small businesses like flourishing in these areas and then they'll kind of take care of themselves. And I ended up in a combat boot factory in Kabul one day. Um, saw 300 people working. It was super cool. I asked the factory manager what they were going to make when the war ended. And he just immediately skipped the beat. And he said, nah, man, we're not going to make anything. People won't buy anything from Afghanistan. All these people are going to go out of work. Um, and I got really furious just knowing that we were going to repeat that cycle. And there I looked down on, you know, on the table and in my half left, there was this like super ugly combat boot sole with a flip-flop thong punch through it. And I was like, man, a combat flip-flop and like the juxtaposition of the words. And I just looked at the factory manager and I said, hey, man, can I run with this? And he says, yeah, sure. And so I like I set it down and I walked out of the factory, uh, went back to my hotel, called my ranger buddy. It was like two o'clock in the morning at L.A. at the time. 
and I said, hey, man, we're going to make flip-flops in Afghanistan and check to see if the domain name combat flip-flops is over. And go figure, like, nobody put that together. Right. So right. Somebody got it from China, 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 we're always hunting for war zones. And then with our profits, we use it to put little girls to school in Afghanistan. That's what we do. Now, awesome. you skipped a, a, a major piece here because uh, uh, well, when Griff and I met, it was actually like in the, in the dusty little, 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 it was a little dust bowl in Tacoma, Washington, uh, supported by our, 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 our buddies out here, Tactical Taylor. But um, then I was invited to um, a watch party for Shark Tank. <laughs> right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, how did that come about? Um, so obviously, if you're a couple special operations guys, like making flip flops in war zones and putting little girls in school in Afghanistan, people find the story really interesting. Um, so we've been had a whole bunch of different media hits, but they were like, OK, um, and like never underestimate anybody right in life. I always give somebody the benefit of the doubt. And I was in L.A. I walked out of a business meeting with Activision, the Call of Duty guys. And we were making some promotional products for their foundation. And I walked across the street into a bar. I was forced to meet like this reporter guy. He worked for some website called Gizmodo. I had no idea what it was, right? Um, rolls up on a cool hipster motorcycle. Says, hey, man, I got like an hour. Then I got to go get on a jet to go party with Billy Idol in Vegas, right? You mind if I record this? And I'm like, okay, whatever. Like we pound a beer. I tell him the story. He's like, all right, man, I'll see you later. Gets on his motorcycle and rides off. And like the next Tuesday, my website started crashing. He, uh, his Gizmodo had like 34 million uniques a month at that point in time. And he wrote probably the best article that's ever been written on our company. And one of the producers from Shark Tank read it. And so they called me on like a Tuesday night at like 1030 at night. And I'm like, I'm not picking this phone call up. Right. And then I listened to voicemail and said, hey, my name is Max. I'm a producer for Shark Tank. I read about you in Gizmodo. Would you come on? And like, to be honest, man, I don't watch TV. So uh, I call him back. I'm like, nah, man, you guys are like American Idol. You guys are taking like young stars and trashing them on TV for entertainment purposes and like shit canning them, right? And so I was like, I don't know. He's like, man, you need to apply. You need to apply. So I just like totally put the guy off and like, all right, man, I'll talk to you whenever. And I uh, I got on the phone call with our team meeting for the stand up the next morning. I told him what happened. And my, my business partner, Lee, my ranger buddy, he's like, are you high? You call him back <laughs> right now. Do you know about the shark tank effect? You do this immediately. Like this makes companies. And so I called the guy back and he's like, okay, I'll apply. So he sends me the packet and um, it's like six or seven pages with a whole bunch of like one question and a whole bunch of like lines for filling it out. And I'm sure people like mull over this for days. Like I was done in like 30 minutes. I might've made it to the end of line two on one of the responses. It was just like really short, direct answers to everything and i sent it to him and he calls me back like 20 minutes later he's like this is the best pitch ever you know <laughs> and so then um we were going to be on and we literally dropped everything we we're doing and we treated it like a ranger mission we watched every episode we profiled all the sharks we measured off the paces from like how guys go from the first door to the second door second door to the mark like how people respond and like we marked everything off we taped it off before we walked into that room you know, we'd been in that room a thousand times, right? So it was hit, 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 hit. And um, people like, we, they, they, do you know the difference between an attack and an array, an array? Do you guys know? Come on. Do you we guys know? Know. Yeah, Absolutely. come on. All right, what's the difference? Come on, Sergeant Major, tell me. Well, an attack is a deliberate uh, kind of mission that you're going to go and you're going to hold terrain. A yeah. raid is you're going to go in and either snatch somebody or you're going to snatch... Uh, something, yep. uh, you're going after a high value target or something like that. And you're not necessarily focused on taking the terrain. You're going to go in and go after and get something of high value. Yeah, it's, While it's an plan. attack may be part of a bigger mission of defeating an enemy, you know, kind of a North Korea scenario where we will continue to attack up the peninsula till we get to Pyongyang. Yeah. So it's the planned withdrawal. And so we treated, we treated Shark Tank yeah. just like a raid, man. We went down there. We were there for like 72 hours and we got what we needed. We yeah, yeah. shook hands with the sharks and then we bounced. We were like, <laughs> we're out of here. We'll see you. And um, it was really cool. Like, uh, you know, it's, it was just interesting experience. Um, we were supposed to air on Veterans Day 2015. So we bought all of the inventory to support that. And then Veterans Day came and went and no Shark Tank. So we almost went out of business. So we like 
fire sold everything in our company. And then they called me when I was at SHOT Show in January. And they're like, yeah, you guys are going to be on in two weeks. And like all of my inventory would have sat on my desk. We had like 20 pairs of flip-flops left. And here we're going to face like the biggest sales event a company will ever face. And so I called one of my Ranger buddies and like, I need $50,000 right now. He's like, what? I was like, you're not getting off the phone with me until you tell your secretary to wire me 50 grand immediately. And a uh, good Ranger buddy, he like, he's like, give me your account number, sent me the money. We got everything into production. And then we just absolutely crushed it. We, we did more business in 36 hours than we did in our entire company history. We put 200 girls in school in Afghanistan and we've been on the ride ever since. It's been fun. Awesome, brother. Hey, Colton, now um, here you are, you're an active duty NCO and uh, all of a sudden you're on the ultimate fighter show. You know, one of the most popular reality TV shows that has to do with combat sports. Tell us how that went about and then tell us uh, your experience in the house. All right. So I had the most minimal experience out of 32 people that are fighting to get in the house. So it was, think of like uh, 32 of the top unsigned free agents in any sport, but this is fighting at 170 pounds. Uh, and, I, and out of 32, I would honestly rank order myself. I was being completely honest. Uh, 32. I was probably number 32 out of 32. Uh, based on just my experience alone. I'm an active duty service member, you know, uh, just an infantryman. I only had a handful of fights, handful of uh, amateur fights, handful of professional fights, uh, and a wrestling experience and some jiu-jitsu experience once I, you know, got into MMA. Um, so when I when I flew out there for the show, to go try out for the show, I actually took a four-day pass. I didn't tell anybody where I was going. <laughs> Sorry, whoever my star major or – Hey, good, Ranger. <laughs> So I, I flew to Vegas and I, I tried out, you know, so I tried out for the show. And even when I get there, you know, I make it through the grappling round. They actually pit you against other people. There's thousands of people in line. I'm looking at these guys. I'm seeing guys that I know from Strike Force, from Pride, from K1, uh, guys that I've watched on, on TV and on YouTube. And I'm like, holy crap, what am I doing in this line? Get through the grappling round, I make it. Get through the striking round, I make it. Then you have the interviews. Now there's probably a thousand of us left. And so we go through the interviews and finally they, you know, they walk me in. They're like, dude, you only got a handful of fights. You know, why are you going to be the ultimate fighter? You know, what do you think about the show? I said, well, number one, I don't watch the show. And they're like, wait, pump the brakes. You just said you don't watch the show you're going to be on. I said, I don't, I don't watch the show, to be honest with you. But you put me on that show and I'm going to F and win. You know, and that was my exact, my, my exact language. And the Fox executives at the time looked at each other like, this dude's, this dude's crazy. Like, and they're like, well, you're active duty. You know, we've had this issue before. There's a Marine, George Lockhart, that wasn't able to, you know, go on the ultimate fighter twice. Um, good friend of mine, by the way. And uh, so they're like, yeah, we've dealt with this before. And I was like, no, listen, I've already been told that I'm good to go. They're like, you have. I said, yeah, I'm good. And I, I wasn't good. Um, but- <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Integrity is your watch, Yeah, I'm sorry. I know. I got integrity, but but I knew. You know, I made- <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So and, and, and I went. I went through the whole whole process, and I had to constantly fly back to Vegas for medicals, you know, drug testing, some you know, secondary interview to find out who the, who the top thirty two were going to be. And uh, every interview, somehow, you know, being in the Star Majors board or something probably set me up to be able to be, you know, precise and uh, just kind of direct. And I wasn't, you know, I knew what I wanted. And I wanted to be on that show. I wanted to prove my medal, prove myself. I didn't just want to be on the show. Like a lot of guys get on the show. They're like, oh, I made it. Yes, I wanted to win the show. I, and I truly believe in some weird ignorance is bliss way that I was going to win that damn show. Uh, and I got in the house. Once I got in the house, you know, and, and I, you know, I thought to get in the house. Had a little hiccup in my fight to get in the house. Uh, I made a mistake. Didn't touch gloves. It's a whole thing. People hate me for it to this day. I didn't do it. Yeah, to me, yeah I, I didn't do it maliciously. But, uh, but anyways, I got in the house. I, I beat an undefeated fighter to do that. Guy that had a lot more experience than me. And then once I got in the house, I watched grown men break. I watched you know the 16 that made it in the house. I watched grown men as every day, every week, Every hour went by. I watched grown men break. These are the best fighters in the world. These guys are supposed to be, you know, physical specimens, mentally, physically, emotionally hard. Uh, and that wasn't the case with a lot of them. Some of them, yes, but a lot of them, they weren't. And I watched it. And even though I only had a handful of fights and they had 20, 30, 40 pro fights, uh, every day that went on in that house and I was winning and everything else, um, I realized that I'm going to win this thing. And I believed it. And a lot of it came from being a soldier, being downrange, living on a bridge you know, uh, uh, north of uh, or south of Fob Falcon, north of Fob Cal Stew on, on Route Tampa, lived on a damn bridge for six months, burned my own feces, 
and I just sit and duck out there. And then, you know, another, another time up in Baghdad and a few other places and stuff in Afghanistan. And, and I just feel like that set me up, that life set me up for this. I mean, I'm in, I'm in Vegas. I have uh, a wish list every night by 10 o'clock of whatever food I want. So I was getting sushi. I was getting protein. I was getting whatever I wanted, whatever I could dream up. I put on a list and the production team would bring that to you. How the hell could I look at this like it was a, a detriment? How the hell could I mean, Yeah, I miss my family. Don't get me yeah. wrong. But I had zero outside distractions. I had nobody bugging me. No one called me at midnight saying that my soldiers at the PMO because he, you know, got a DUI or something. But no, but I, you know, I had no outside distractions. It was the first time in my life, in my military career, my fighting career, where I could focus solely on one thing, and that was fighting, and that was my nutrition. That was me staying physically, mentally, emotionally hard for uh, whatever the next fight was. And so that's why I flourished. I could focus fully on fighting, not not on war fighting, not on being an NCO because I was a staff sergeant at the time. Um, but it was one of those things where I looked at it as, uh, you know, this is my best opportunity to shine and make it to the UFC, win the ultimate fighter. And, uh, and that's what I did. You know, I set my goals on it. So after I beat everybody in the house, uh, there was one man left. He was a Canadian. I was a three to one underdog. He was you know, he was uh, Dana White basically told me, like, hey, congratulations, man. You you defied all odds, but there's no way. Basically, you know, you're going to get through Richie. You know, and I'm like, I'm going to you know, I'm going to beat this guy They're like no, nah, I don't think you will. Well, I lived with this guy for six, six weeks in the house. So I saw his mannerisms. I saw his issues. I saw who he was as a person. I didn't like it. He was a, not only was he Canadian. I had nothing wrong with that, obviously, but uh, he wasn't a very good person. And I, I looked at it as an opportunity not only to uh, prove to myself that I belong, but beat a guy like him who is, you know, trains full time, trains at TriStar up in Montreal with GSP, you know, top top guys in the world. I trained, you know, with Army guys in a combatives facility. That's where I trained at, you know. And yeah, Tim Kennedy would pull me in, and I trained with Tim three days out of the week leading up to that eight weeks bef- between the finale and when I got out of the house. And I got there and I smashed him. That was one of my easiest fights I've ever had. Uh, you know, I, I absolutely destroyed him, you know, beat all the odds, three to one underdog. Some of my battle buddies from Iraq actually threw some money in and made a bunch of money, uh, you know, betting on me and stuff like that. So that night at the Hard Rock, that was one of my defining moments in my, mil- in my, my fighting career, not my military career. And uh, General Campbell, actually Don Campbell, three corps commander at the time, I know your old, your old battle buddy, uh, Sergeant Major, he uh, expected me to, to, to get out, you know, get out of the military. And um, I was up for reenlistment. I said, you know, I'm reenlisting. They're like, what do you mean you're reenlisting? You just, you know, won this show. You're, you're probably going to get out and go do big things fighting. But uh, I couldn't leave it behind, and I, and I haven't left it behind. So it might have been one of those things where people are like, man, you should probably uh, focus on one or the other. But I can't do that. You know, I, I, not only do I love being a fighter, uh, being a soldier, being a war fighter, uh, I love being a father and a husband, obviously. Uh, but being an entrepreneur as well. So all these all these irons in the fire, I feel like uh, for me, with my faith, it's my God birth dream to do all these things and uh, whatever fueled me to continue to do it regardless of the naysayers. Man, that's great. awesome, brother. Positive mental attitude. You knew you were going to win, so you won, right? You kept that in your head. That's right. Yeah, and I, I believed it. I did, and everybody laughed at me. People were like, man, you're crazy. Even when I was doing interviews in the house, they're like, hey, man, you made it pretty far. High five. That's really cool. Uh, but, you know, after I was just destroying people with basic Iowa wrestling, <laughs> you know, I progressed. Yeah. Into, I'm now Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt and, you know, Muay Thai and stuff Not like that. Not this kind of wrestling, though, right? I don't have that. I don't have that yet. No, no. That's the, that's the next logical step, right? Like, I'm yeah, looking forward to that day. Entertainer. That's where, that's where the money's at. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it looks like we got a, a, a question here from the audience uh, for Matt. So, uh, Griff, is there a, was there anything during your transition that helped you learn how to form your own business, or is that something that you self-trained uh, after you got out? What are some of the financial pitfalls you ran into when it comes to starting your own business from scratch? Uh, first is um, – a lot of times we're down range and, you know, we're, we're sometimes we're around like the super elite guys, you know, and uh, those guys are always reading. And so if they're reading something, you like want to lean over and say, hey, what are you reading? And I find out they were reading all these business leadership books. Hmm. And so I was like, they were like, we got a reading list. I was like, well, can you give me that reading list? If you guys are reading it, I should read it. Um, and it's just a lot of a lot of business leadership books. And then when I got out, like I'm not a big fan of school, especially for business. I don't want to go to college to be taught by some business professor on how to run a business. Cause if he was that good at running a business, he'd be running his own business. Right. 
if you can't do teach. Um, and yeah. so I, I, I signed, I found this uh, website called personalmba.com. Um, and it's like 99 books. And if you read them and understand the concepts of them, you'll have the equivalent of an Ivy league MBA and you can do it for the price of a library card, which is free. It's, it's really simple. And then like, you just got to start is really the answer. And then whenever you run into a problem in your business and you're like, crap, I'm having a problem here. You look down your reading list. What's the book that applies to that problem? Go pull that book off the shelf, read through it. It'll tell you how to fix your problem. Then get off your ass and go do it. Right. That's really how entrepreneurship works. It's like building the plane as you're on your way to the ground. That's there's never a perfect time to start a business. You're never going to have all the cash you want. Your sales and forecasts are usually wildly uh, untrue when you first start. Um, and so that leads into my second part of like the financial pitfalls is, bro, you're not going to be a millionaire in six months, no matter what that spreadsheet says. It doesn't work like that. The elevator to success is broken. You got to take the stairs. Right. And you're going to have to grind it out just like every other entrepreneur um, and, and just do it. And the, the best advice I got as I was like starting my own company was and everybody was telling me no as we were pitching for money, because imagine who's going to like give a dude money to make flip flops in Afghanistan. Really? I mean, come on now. Yeah. And uh, so I was getting told no all the time. And some guy just was like really kind to me. And he said, hey, what do you do as a CEO? And I was like, I, I don't know. Like, and I gave him some like crappy MBA answer from some book that I read, right? Or like a course that I didn't attend. And he's like, nah, man, you do three things. He's like, you raise money, you hire well, and then you solve problems, right? Cash is king, whether it's in sales or whether you're going for investment. I prefer to go with sales first, make your own money, don't get somebody else's. Um, hire well, always hire people that are smarter than you and better than you and be humble about it. Like you're hiring them for a reason. And then third is solve problems. Um, nobody cares about your problems as a business owner. Like you care about your problems as a business owner. The buck literally stops with you. Mm -hmm. It is really easy for employees or staff or whatever to run into a roadblock and go, I don't know how to fix it. Push away from the desk and go, Hey, I can't solve this problem. Right. I don't know how to fix it either, but I'm going to demonstrate the, <laughs> the intestinal fortitude to find the book to figure it out. Right. Or get on Google and then read through the actions and then make a plan to do it. Um, and that's really where like most entrepreneurs fail is they think that somebody else is always going to solve their problems for them versus now, man, you get, I got get up and do it by yourself. We had no money, no business experience and no footwear manufacturing experience. We started a multi-million dollar global footwear company. Right. And it's, you just got to read wow. the book and then get off your ass and go do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, awesome. that's, that's incredible. Just, just, you know, the, uh, I always love one thing about you, Griff, is that you you find these life hacks, you know, not shortcuts. It's more of a hack to just get, you know, directly to what do I need from this? Minus all the bullshit. Like I say, my my, my uh, VA home loan classes, you know, we want the stuff, not the fluff. Right. You yeah. know, all that, all that crap that's uh, that's all surrounded by that. Um, I, I, I have a go ahead. Yeah. Got yeah. Hey, so, Colton, now to, to, to off of what Griff just said. So here you are. You're you're still on active duty. You're the ultimate fighter champion. Then you decide to become an entrepreneur. You start your own company, Enlisted Nine uh, Fight Club, you know, with apparel. And I notice you're sporting your own shirt here, you know. Um, it's all about the brand, afford, baby. It's all about the brand. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think you guys can afford something other than schmediums, though, right? <laughs> but, uh, now it's a you, 2X, you, man. It's a 2X. I'm filling it out. What are you there saying? You go, <laughs> <laughs> So what was your what was your mindset? You know, here you are. You won the most pre prestigious fighting show. You're still on active duty. You're still doing the business of a soldier. What was the mindset to all of a sudden, you know, for you and Megan to go into, hey, let's start our own business and listed nine fight club. And then as it morphed, you know, even after you worked for me for two years, then you went out and now you've opened your own gym. So tell us the mindset and where you're going with that. So. Being a being a let's talk about being a, a fighter, professional fighter, it, it's very lucrative for a very short amount of time. Uh, your lifespan is only as good as your last fight. Uh, whether you get a car accident or something happens, we're not like the NFL or ML, MLB or NHL where there's a, a you know a kind of a pension program after five years of being a bench warmer. You get a pension program, and the UFC that that's not the case. So uh, Tim Kennedy actually gave me some mentorship as far as trying to find a way that I can take my uh, winnings from the Ultimate Fighter, my contract that I received, and some of the other bonuses I, I received in my, during my time in the UFC, and uh, put it towards something that's going to be a long-term, lasting, 
uh, past my military career as well because he knew understood my my desire to want to stay being a soldier and a leader. Um, so I, I, I took that, took his advice, and um, around the same time as we started the first first couple shirts, the second Fort Hood shooting happened. And when the second Fort Hood shooting yeah. happened, uh, the Fisher House was having issues with a lot of the family members. They didn't have space in the Fisher House in the local Fort Hood area. And so we actually uh, created a Colton Smith shirt, uh, and uh, it looked kind of affliction-y. And, uh, you know, it was after I won the open fighter, and people around the area understood, uh, and they were, they were fans, and they were friends. And so I sold a bunch of those shirts, and we took a lot of the, the proceeds, and we gave it straight to the Fisher House and a check. And that was a big deal for us to do that. And um, once we were able to help out some of those families, we realized, you know, we have something here, something we can monetize, something that we can build something for our families. Myself, um, my, my wife, I should just say my wife and my business partner at the time, because I wasn't doing a whole lot. I was kind of a knuckle dragger, pulling security, drinking water while they were, you know, figuring out how to be business owners. None of us were business owners previously. Uh, my business partner, uh, command Sergeant Major Dan O'Brien, uh, he's retired. Um, he is an artist. He understood the teacher industry. My wife is a worker bee. I mean, she is uh, one of the hardest workers I've ever met in my life. And we, we hit the ground running full steam ahead. Uh, my house went from having one bedroom where we had, you know, uh, uh, boxes floor to ceiling with a plastic table. And my wife would hammer out packages there uh, to, you know, multiple rooms to our carport to all, you know, just our living room full of boxes. And uh, she was just grinding day and night. You know, she was customer service. She was fulfillment. She was, uh, you know, media. She was uh, doing all the marketing campaign. And look at stuff she's learning on her own as well. Well, I'm at East Georgia, while Clancy was a major O'Brien. Is uh, command sergeant major, you know, where, where he was, and we were able to somehow make this work and, and learn uh, through trial and error. Nothing was given to us. Uh, we got a few big breaks, similar similar uh, to Griff. We had a few big breaks that happened, and we were able to, you know, monetize that, and it was very lucrative. Um, but the biggest thing I'd say about enlisted nine flight company, we have stayed true to who we are. We have chased the buck because we are our business. However, we stayed true and surrounded ourselves with the right people. Uh, throughout time, 2013 is when we kicked off, and uh, we've done we've done amazing things since then uh, for the local pu public, local population, the military population as well, and giving back as much as possible. We don't really talk about that; we're rather restricted about that. But we do what we can to to assist our fellow man and woman uh, in America, and and do what we can for that. We're with Nine Line Apparel now down in Savannah, Georgia. We're co-located with them at their headquarters. Uh, they do all of our fulfillment and help us with customer service and all that stuff, and. Um, it's just been an amazing ride. I mean, we have 930,000 people on Facebook. Or, you know, we reach anywhere from 30 to 40 to 50 million people a month on our site. Um, we do some funny stuff, some satirical content as well, but mainly it's just patriotic stuff. We love America. We love what we do. We love that we serve. And again, my, my wife, my, my business partner, and myself, uh, if this ended today, we couldn't be mad. It's been amazing for our family, amazing for our future, and we just pray it continues. Awesome. Man, that's so. How, how would you think? I mean, I'll go back with you, Grip. Piggybacking off of that, off of what you see, you know, Colton doing um, as an active duty soldier, you know, preparing, you know, really the, the next stages of his life, and you know, potentially, you know, his kids' lives, and you know, right now with, you know, uh, who knows how far transitions out out is for for you, right, Colton? Man, you're you're still hard charging. I mean. Uh, for you, some Griff, as someone that's gotten out, I mean, what would you say? What would be your message to those that are, you know, in and, and planning? Like, when is the right time to start transitioning? Um, just whenever it feels right. Like, if you find your heart's not in it anymore, like, you got to know your heart's not in it anymore. The guys that you're serving deserve all of you. And if you're not given 150%, like 100% and then some, and you just find like you're just being drawn away somewhere else, that's time for you to step away while you can. Mm -hmm. And the, the big green machine will keep rolling. Um, yeah. The prep. Yeah. The, the prep that I'll tell everybody that I tell every single guy that's getting out is like, all you got to do is stack cash right now. Like you're down range, you're deployed, you're getting hazard pay. It's tax free. Don't buy the fancy hot rod. Don't buy the fancy motorcycle. Don't have the tits apartment, right? Like stack cash like you are in a very unique position because a lot of guys, they're not prepared for it. The army actually pays you very well. Like when you're in a, a high paced military unit and I got out in between my wife and I dual military captains, combat pay, jump pay, hazardous duty pay, tax free. 
we took a 75% reduction in income in a month, right? It went from like on the gas to whoop, and welcome to civilian life. Yeah. You got to work hard. So like save your money, get light and do that. Yep. Yeah. Take the stairs, not the elevator. Yep. Take right? the stairs. And like, as, as Colton was saying, like my mentor, I got Steve, he started a multi-million dollar tactical business and he did it by saving all of his TDY money. And just like Colton, like he fulfilled boxes out of his back bedroom. And when he, when he, the boxes wouldn't fit in the bedroom anymore, he like moved his car out of the garage and they wouldn't fit in the bedroom in the garage anymore. Then he finally went and found a, a really crappy building, right. To like mm -hmm. throw a plywood table in and put some shelves in and start fulfilling out of there. Like, it's not like you see on TV. People aren't going to come and throw money at you. If you're not willing to put your own money in the business, they're not willing to put their money in the business. They're not willing to put you up in a fancy office with a big sign. He's like, gut it out, man. Grind that thing out. And you're always going to look back on those days when like, man, I was filling out of my garage. Like, I miss that. Yeah. I really do. Yep. Yeah. Much, much, simpler, much simpler times then, for sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Keith, Keith Bach, our, our buddy, fellow Ranger buddy, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Keith says, uh, Griff, one thing that I took away, from, and then I have a question about, about uh, Keith and you after this, Colton. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I'll, I'll save that for the rapid fire. Uh oh, I don't know what the question's going to be. Don't, don't <laughs> <laughs> uh, Griff, one thing I took away from you speaking at the Ranger for Life program a little over a year and a half ago was on goal setting. I think many of us fail, uh, lack understanding, and overcomplicate goal setting. It is obvious that you and Colton set goals and had a system to meet them. Can you speak on the importance of goal setting and use of a daily journal uh, during transitioning? Great question. Yeah. So my journal is right here. It's always within arm's reach because uh, as an entrepreneur, you got so much stuff going on. You can't keep everything in your head. You got to write it down. Um, and it's also just good for life, right? Um, so inside my journal on the inside of the front cover, I have uh, my three month goals, one year goal, three year goals, and then lifetime goals. And under each one of those, there's only three subtasks. That's it. Like, what are the, what are the big three things that I want to do in the next 90 days? What are the big three things that I want to do this year in three years? And in my lifetime, if I'm only going to be remembered for three things, what are they? Right. And then through that little, diagram, you can build your path from three months to one year to three years to lifetime. And then you can paint that picture, right? And being able to paint it and see it is it's driving you at the direction you want to go. And like you see it in your head, you put it down on paper. That's the first step in manifesting into reality that's on paper. And then you start doing that action. And then you figure out whichever thing is going to be the, the biggest thing in the next three months to move you forward along that path. It's called your game changer, right? And you literally put that on the other page right next to it. And you start doing all the subtasks off that game changer to make that goal complete. And then every day I get up and this is the mindset that I give to a lot of guys and it's just fucking math. I'm sorry for the language, but it's just math. Yeah. Your to-do list will never end. It will end when you're dead. Mm -hmm. You will always have more things to do in a day than you can ever get accomplished. And you cannot let yourself feel bad about that ever. But what you can do is say, there is one task that I need to do today that will move me closer to my goals. And that's called your daily game changer. And if I spend two focused hours a day on that one task, I have the rest of the day to go work out, hang out with my kids, like finish the rest of my stuff, answer all of my emails, pay my bills, do all that other stuff. But if you add that up Monday through Friday, that's 10 hours, mm -hmm. right? Over the course of a month, that's 40 hours. That's an entire work week of me focused on something that's going to move me forward. Over the course of a year, that ends up being a quarter. I'm spending one solid dedicated quarter per year on the things that are most important to me and moving me toward my life's goals. And it's it's not hard to do. It's like, I got one thing I need to do today. I got to spend one to two hours today doing it and I'm going to do it. And if I don't get it done, I'm going to be okay with it because I know I, I worked on it a little bit and moved it forward. And that's just how you do goal setting. Is you find out the next the thing that's biggest for you in the next 90 days, write down all the subtasks that you got to do and just commit yourself every day to doing one of those subtasks. Mm -hmm. And over time, inches make miles, man. Inches yeah. make miles. Yep. That's huge. Yeah. Yep. That's huge. Uh, let's hey, see. So, go ahead. So, go ahead John. Quick, quick for both of you. We, we, all of us here, all of, all four of us here 
our, our veterans or like Colton still serving, when we've lived by this attitude of selfless service throughout our military career, which right. means we think of others before we think of ourselves. But as you mentioned, Griff, when it's all said and done, I mean, you took a 75% pay cut and all of us, um, in order to reach our life goals, have to continue to push our personal brand to get after those life goals. You know, there's still a point of being selfless about it, but it's a little bit more dynamic. And as I've learned in six months of being retired and uh, Griff and Ron, you, you've probably seen this too. It's a dog eat dog world out here. And, uh, you know, you can't just, uh, you know, go to your next chain of higher chain of command, or you can't go to the chaplain or, or to, you know, the, the, uh, dang uh, IG office to get help or anything. So um, how important do you think it is when when someone is getting ready to transition and they want to be goal oriented as they get out and they want to push to do things like be a business owner or be a gym owner? How important is it that you balance that selflessness while also to driving to get your personal goals? Man, I'll I'll take the first stab at that, and I'll say that the 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 it, just like Griff is saying is you have to start right, but the the that the transition in our own head and our own brain of I should focus on me is it's it's a hard thing to do, and it's I, I think it's a mm -hmm. uh, it's something that isn't discussed enough, and and these you know in, in having these conversations because. It's, it's, um, where we all come from, all literally all four of us here, we don't think of ourselves when we're going to work, right? We don't, we don't, we, we, when we come home, we don't think of ourselves. We think of our family, we think about others so much. So, uh, it, it, and it's so habitual and so programmed and so every day that by the time we, we, we look at and, and kind of do a sit rep and assess what's happening, we're like, oh shit, I need to, you know, switch, switch the folk, the mindset here. Uh, so I, I think it's, has to be in education and, and, and obviously programming like yeah. this, we're trying to do, um, but to let people know like, Hey, here's the point where it's, it's, it's okay to start focusing on you. And I think Griff nailed, nailed it on the head and I'll just half, half hand it off to you, Griff. And from this point is when you start feeling that you're not giving your, your, your people 150%, yeah. and it's literally 150%, hundred percent is good, but yeah. we all know if you're going to really give a shit, you got to really do it. And once that starts to, to, to come down a little bit, that's when it's it's time to say, OK, there's a reason for that. And now I need to continue that momentum and just focus that on me and and, and then start preparing for those things for transition. What does it look like in my, in my next chapter uh, of life? Right. My next novel of life, we'll say. Uh, so um, and I think that's where, where it begins. Griff. Yeah. Um, I love the line like you can't pour from an empty cup. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you just can't. Um, and the, fortunately, the army fills your cup, right? They make sure you get paid on the first and the 15th. They make sure you're fed. They make sure you got a place to work out and they make sure you got a roof over your head and a place to sleep most of the time, right? They take care of you. They fill your cup. That's why you can push so hard. Um, but when you get out, there's nobody there to fill your cup but you. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there, there comes a time when you really need to say like, okay, Hey, I really need to focus on being my best self, filling my cup so I can fill that of others. Right. I want to see my team succeed on their goals. And the only way they're going to succeed on their goals is really if I'm demonstrating the example of how I through discipline and hard work and focus and teamwork accomplish mine. And I'm very open about communicating my team with my goals and my plan to do it. And I show them how I do it. And then I watch them do it as well. Um, and, you know, I work with my team. Like the, one of the things that I have is like if anybody on my team is waiting on me to do their job for something that immediately goes to the top of the list. Like I will not let my team lag or anybody fall on their personal responsibility because I've failed to do something. Um, so that's where yeah. that selflessness comes in is like you got to make sure your team can do their job. But at some point, too, like if they see you haggard and hungry and tired and sh hungover or whatever, then they're going to think it's OK to perform like that. It's not, yeah. you got to be in shape. You got to show up early. You got to put in your best. You got to be prepared for meetings. And when you set that pace as the leader, then everybody else follows behind you on that too. Mm -hmm. All right. And if they don't, they just remove themselves from the culture pretty quickly. Yeah. Colton, we're going to go to you for ask you your take on that. But first of all, Michael Sewell is a huge fan of yours. And he just wanted to make sure that you knew he was a huge fan. And he said, hello on the enlisted night fight company page. Now, 
asking you this question and what Griff just talked about being selfless. You, you, when you worked for me when I was the SEAC and you were my operations NCO and we were traveling all over the world, you took a professional fight against an undefeated fighter, uh, Brady, um, who's now in the UFC. And I told you that you didn't have to travel, that we would pick up your slack so that you could focus on training, on dieting and everything. And you didn't do it. And as a matter of fact, uh, and Griff, you'll like this. We went to visit the University of Northern Iowa for a trip in the middle of February. And uh, I spoke at a ROTC event there. And the National Guard, you know, being Iowa National Guard, they everybody's a wrestler there. And so they had an area that we could go and train over at their armory. And Colton didn't have anybody to train with. And he was beating the shit out of himself, you know, up against this cage and everything. So... Colton, my question, same question that Ron and, and uh, Griff answered, but you refused to even show that there was any kind of inkling that you may not be holding up your end. And you continued to travel with me. I mean, you were finding gyms in Canada to train with when we would go in El Paso, wherever we went. Hell, you know, a bunch of dang Navy special operators showed up with dang cauliflower ears and the Djibouti so that uh, you could train with them while we were over there visiting our special ops guys in the Middle East. So same with you. I mean, how did, how did you balance this, brother? Here's what it boils down to. Bottom line, uh, if I just put it in simpleton terms, make the best case scenario for your situation. Make the, I, don't, I don't care what people say. You know, I hear fighters all the time. Oh, I didn't get a full camp. I didn't get to go train with so-and-so. I had an injury. I don't care about any of that. Make the best case scenario for your situation. So I made the best case scenario for my situation without uh, being a detriment to the team, without being a detriment to the OCAC, the office, the single supervisor, the chairman, your office. Um, I, there's no way that I could look myself in the mirror every single day knowing that, yes, I'm training for a fight. Yes, I'm training for you know a very, very uh, formidable opponent. Um, but at what cost? Is that the cost of my family time? Is that the cost of my – uh, fellow service members happen not being able to spend time with their families because they're picking up my slack overseas or traveling with you. I mean, bottom line, you were gone, you know, 255 days out of the year. I mean, that's in, that's an insane pace to keep, but it was in a very important mission, and I knew that. And, and that's one of the things that I look back on, and I'm I'm still glad I still make that decision today. I still make that same decision of of uh, definitely not letting anybody pick up my slack because, it, it, like he said, like Griff said, and Ron said. Uh, at that point, it's probably time for me to throw on my towel and just focus on fighting full time uh, as a senior non commissioned officer. It's probably time for me to, uh, you know, say, you know what, maybe I need to focus on this instead. But uh, I am a, I am a service, a service member and a soldier first. I am. I mean, that's how I've always been. And again, people have kind of chastised me for it, but that's that's always how my mindset's been. Griff, you want to know how dedicated this guy was when we were in Waterloo and Cedar Falls, Iowa. Myself and my public affairs guy, Rob Couture, were eating made rights. Brother, you know the staple of Iowa. And this dude was eating celery, man. Now that's almost, you know, that's almost sacrilege going to Iowa and not eating made rights, you know, and eating celery. That's how dedicated he was to making sure that uh, he was on weight and he was prepared for his fight, man. Now I know there's a bunch of drunk guys at the Skid Row bars down in the Quad Cities and stuff. They're looking at Colton Smith said he ain't from Iowa if he ain't eating made right. I don't care what he was training for. Yeah. And all wrestlers know that that uh, that temporary moratorium and all the things you want to eat and love when you're training. Like it's just a part of life if you're into that sport. That's right. I don't what the hell are you guys talking about? What's a made right? <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> so well, Made Right is a, a a sandwich shop in Iowa, and it's a staple. Every wow. anytime any of us go back to Iowa, we go get Made Right. Um, what else we get, guys? What Colton? What's what's some of the other things? Griff, um, you know, in Davenport, Harris Pizza. Griff, I know you've had Harris Pizza before, you know, and uh, you know, Happy Joe's and stuff like that. It's just it's the but the Made Right is a staple sandwich. It's like a a uh, sloppy Joe, but it's just, you know, pulled hamburger with onions in it, you know, and, and, uh, you know, with ketchup and mustard or whatever, but it's just a staple. And I mean, when I go there, I can get four or five of them and eat them, you know? And uh, um, so it's just something that, you know, we do when we go back to Iowa. Kind of like, so, like, like us from California, we got to have an in and out burger as soon as we cross that border. Yep. 
There you go. Got if you're, if right. you're waiting for 45 minutes to get it, man. <laughs> hey, hey, I got to give a shout out to my, my Texas brethren. You know, I spent a lot of time in Texas. Chris Perkins. I saw him pop up on the screen a few times, some comments. Chris, thank you for everything, man. He was the NCIC, or excuse me, the uh, well, NCIC at one point, but he was the uh, course director as a civilian for three core combatives. And he was very integral in, in me getting to the Oakland fighter and kind of being that conduit between um, General General Campbell, uh, UFC, and, the, and, and General Odierno, the chief of staff at the time. So, Chris Perkins, I saw you pop on the screen a few times. Thank you very much, man, for all the support. I love you, brother. That's so all. Awesome. Ron, what else does the audience want to know, man? Well, let's see. Uh, we got so many questions out there, Vic, that we uh, we haven't answered. Maybe want to pop up. That's our that's our producer, by the way. <laughs> um. I saw uh, hey, so a question, Colton. I got a Mike Hatfield just jumped in. You know, Mike is a good friend of mine. You know, I work with him at Alpha Warrior and everything. And you know what he looks like. He's a big guy, you know, big muscular guy. So you get in the cage with Hatfield. How are you going to take him down? See, yeah, the only way I can take a guy like Mike Hatfield down, Sergeant Major, Mike Hatfield, I know you're watching, is to chop him down, See, yeah, That's all I can do. <laughs> <laughs> He's a big hey, take that human baseball bat, that shin, and put it on his dang lower legs. I got to chop him down so I can put that shin on his chin. That's that's about all I can do. <laughs> oh. oh, man. What, oh. Uh, let's see. Oh, Just... my, my concho. All right. That's one of my <laughs> favorite. I'm, I'm his favorite now. So, okay, my concho. I <laughs> I'm pseudo, by the way. I, I know this guy. He's, a, he's my RTO in Afghanistan. All right, I got something for you, Mike Hunter. <laughs> for you. Oh. Hey, did I just see this right? Did I did I just see Megan Smith put on there as a comment that she gets a plane made right? Did I read that right? Yep. What kind yeah, of outfit are you running over there in that Smith household, man? I'm I'm in that same boat. Hey, she's uh, oh wow. She's from Iowa. She knows it. She knows the deal. I don't I don't let anything interfere with the flavor. Nothing. There you go. <laughs> Candace Day, shout out to Colton. I'm a boxer, but high, high fives. <laughs> hey, I, respect, I respect the boxers. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know that about Candace. Who would have thought? Did you Did you know that, John? She's a boxer. No, I, Candace is pretty fit. I'm telling you, if if there was a, a, a Ultimate Fighter division for realtors. You know, and, and you had to be a realtor and a fighter. <laughs> I think Candace would have one of those things that Colton's going around with that crystal, yeah. you know. Because so Candace right, hang on the walls. Yeah. Yeah, uh. <laughs> oh, man. That would, that, that would be good. That would be good. Uh, actually, uh, there, was a, there was a showdown that went online a, a while ago on the combat flip-flop side. And, and um, you know, one thing that, that you don't do is you, you don't uh, threaten – uh, somebody, especially in the combat flip-flops area with a bunch of Rangers that can find a solution. Griff, can, can you just put a little light on when, when, when there was that challenge that we were trying to uh, arrange for people to come out to Washington? <laughs> Some guy got on our page and started talking smack. And then uh, our intern um, you know, got on there and, he, and he, he's a decent fighter, right? Good guy, like puts a lot of time in the, in the sport. And like the guy started talking smack to our intern, right? And I'm, I'm okay. Like if you want to talk smack, but don't talk don't, don't be rude to my people. And I was like, all right, man, here's the deal. It's like Washington's a, uh, it's a mutual combat state. So if you go to a law enforcement officer and you say, Hey, I want to fight this dude. And you both agree in front of the law enforcement officer, you guys can both fight with no liability. It's how it works in Washington state, old school rules. Like I want to fight this dude. We get a cop to supervise and like, we can get down. And I said, Hey man, Here's the deal. I put together a GoFundMe in about 20 minutes. And I was like, we're going to we're gonna pay for your hotel, your airfare, your rental car, everything. We're going to fly you out here and you're going to fight my intern. Like, and the guy totally backed out. He called me bickering <laughs> and crying. And the, and the worst part, he was a Marine, right? Oh, so then like, then you got like, uh, Ranger, like <laughs> he was here on the phone with me and we were talking so much smack to this guy about him backing out of a fight. He's like, oh, I'm trying out for this unit. I was like, oh, what? Like, oh, okay, I know guys in that unit. I'll get you leave. I'll call down there. You'll be fine, right? Because I, I still got all my contacts, all my buddies <laughs> are running the show now. I'm like, it's good. You're gonna be fine. Yeah, come on, you can fly out. And the guy totally backed out. But like, yeah, he eventually backed out of it. We took all the money that we raised and we donated it to the uh, the station foundation. 
which is a transition organization for special operations veterans. And so we just gave it all to them. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Looks like we got a couple of questions from the audience here, here, John. Colton and Griff, okay. best podcast you are listening to now. Ooh, that's a good one. Colton, I'll let you take this one first. Yeah, I'll go, I'll go first. So, so uh, I do listen to some Joe Rogan. He's, he's a little bit out there, but Joe, uh, you know, Joe always had my back when I was in the UFC and fighting and stuff. So, Listen a little bit of Joe Rogan, some of it's kind of out there, but it, it's some good stuff. And then a uh, uh, good good buddy of mine, uh, Pat Militich, good buddy of both of ours, uh, he tells yeah. some podcasts and stuff. I'll listen to Pat, hear his, hear his view on what's going on in the world as well. And then uh, David Goggins, man. I, I, anything yep. that David Goggins is on, it's just – he's one of those guys. He's um, uh, one of those characters that um, – some of his own don't like him. You know, some of some people in the special operations community don't like him, don't like what he stands for. But I like his brash approach. I like his no BS attitude. I mean, the guy has rabdo and he's still finishing, you know, 100-mile races and stuff like that. So that kind of mindset, that kind of mindset of fail hard, fail fast, fail often, uh, that, that that resonates with me in a large way. Um, not necessarily the, the best calculated approach, but I think in the broad scale of things, uh, that mantra, understanding the, the you know, fail fast, fail, fail often, fail hard. Uh, that you know, I see that in any kind of podcast like that, I'll check it out. But other than that, I don't really have a whole lot of time to listen to too much. Uh, if I was doing a drive to the Pentagon back in the day, I'd listen to some some podcasts or audio books. But uh, now I'm just hitting the ground running with my gym and with with my company and and you know, with the military, with family and stuff like that. So it, I don't have a whole lot of time for that stuff, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to go with Colton on that too. Um, you know, my office is three blocks from my house. Uh, so when I wake up in the morning, I got my, my set routine and then, you know, I'm at work five minutes later and what I've really been focused on over the last year was silence. Um, just being quiet. I used to play music in my headset all the time, but you find those creative answers. Those things are there in your head, but if you're drowning them out with all the other noise, they're just getting washed out. You can't hear them. Uh, so just spending a lot more time uh, being silent is uh, is really the thing I've been focused on over the last year. And uh, say like the closest thing I do to a podcast is uh, there's a website called Daily Ohm. Um, and so it's more on learning like relationships and interpersonal tools. Right. And as you know, I explain this to young guys all the time, especially Rangers getting out. It's like, did you know how to fire our Carl Gustav before you joined the army? Nope. Did you know it was going to be one of the best tools to lay waste and like win the day? Nope. Right. But you'd learn how to do it. And then you use that tool effectively. So when you get out, you're not, you're going to have to use a different toolkit and your toolkit is going to be relationships, conversation, body position, um, and how you're really interacting with folks. And those, those are going to be the tool, the new tools that you have to, to go out and people like, Oh, those are all the soft skills. You know, you guys are all these hard guys that are like, yeah, man, I can't look at every problem. Like it's if it, a nail and the only tool I have is a hammer. Right. You got to learn different skills as you move forward in life. And so daily ohm is probably the closest thing I have to that. But they just send you an email every day. Every day. I, I read through it. I do a little writing exercise. Yeah. Hey, uh, Colton. So your mom, Lori Ann Norris, says, love you, Colton and John. So I got as much press from your mom as you did. <laughs> <laughs> Man, all right. Hey, and then I get a shout out to Jeff Thomas. <laughs> Jeff says, jumping in to say, awesome show. Looking forward to your next one. Ron, Griff, Colton, and Siak, thank you for your service. Hey, thank, thank you, Jeff. Jeff. We appreciate you, Jeff. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Jeff. John, you think we ought to do some rapid fire now to these two uh, guests we've had today? Yes. Uh, are, you, you, want to, you want to kick it off or you want me to kick it off? Yeah. So, Colton, here's the scenario. You're in the cage. You're getting ready to fight. Now, Ron and I have been doing a lot of talking about Tiger King here. All right. And so you are, I have three opponents in the cage. You've got Joe Exotic. You have Carol Baskin. And you have a tiger. Tell us your strategy in order to defeat those three threats. All without right. getting fed to the tiger by Carol or Carol and the tiger getting taken out and all of a sudden Joe having his way with you. So... Tell us your strategy there. All right, Joe Exotic, easy day. Uh, you know, hit him right on the butt and knock him out. Now, when it comes to, to, to Carol, I got to be very careful because if I go to second round with Carol, she may have spiked my, you know, my water in the corner. Uh, I might I might take some of that and next thing you know, sardine oil's on me and tiger's coming across the cage. 
attacking me, killing me, and stuff like that. So uh, as long as I finish Carol in the first round, I'm good to go. But second or third round, I might have some issues with, with old Carol Baskin there. She's slick. You got to watch her. You know, she's uh, she killed her husband, as everyone knows, after watching that show. So you got to watch out for Carol Baskin. Uh, now with the Tiger itself, uh, I don't know, man. Tiger's a tough one. I don't know how I'm going to defeat the Tiger in the cage. Hopefully her Dean or whoever the referee is can step in the way, and I just got to outrun him and wear the Tiger out, hopefully jump on its back and tear its throat out. Something along those lines is the way I see it. But no matter what, I'll be victorious because I believe in it. There you go. Oh, man. Okay, Griff, have you seen the Tiger King? I have not, but I know how I would handle this situation. Okay, that's not my question for you, though. That's All right. For you. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a character on Tiger King, which is the uh, is, is, old, is old Meth Mouth, if you've seen that guy, right? He I can to- imagine. I got a vision in my head. It kind of looks like me with it's husbands. It's, it is. It's one of Joe jo- Exotic's husbands, okay? Yeah. And uh, God, you haven't seen it. So I'm going to describe it to you. He, has, he literally has three teeth from, being, from having Meth Mouth. Uh, he has tattoos like all over, like pointing down, even, even down all up and through here. Uh, he looks like, uh, I mean, he would just, just demolish a 24 pack of Taco Bell extra hot sauce. So my question to you is you got each, you have, you have two people, Donald Lee and meth mouth from Tiger King. They both crush 24 pack of tacos and you have to share a sleeping bag with one of them. Which one is it? Lee, I got experience cuddling that dude all day long. <laughs> He's really convenient. Like he'll roll over, he'll he'll be my backpack, and then I get cold, then we'll flip over, right? Like I'm I'm totally going for Lee. I mean, you know with some rumble in the, in the guts. I mean, that's 24 Taco Bell tacos, extra spicy. Like, so I, I've shared a lot of hotel rooms with this dude. Um, and he's pretty considerate with the uh, the gastrointestinal stuff. The worst part about him is sleeping next to him. He sounds like a chainsaw getting or a bear getting mauled by a chainsaw. And so our, our rhythm is I take all the pillows off of his bed, except for the one that he's sleeping with. And then like when he starts snoring, I'll like slam him from the other bed with a pillow. And like I'll wake up in the morning and he'll have all the pillows and I'll have one. So <laughs> like I'm trained sleeping with him, dude. I, I'm, I'm not afraid. <laughs> not afraid. Not afraid. Hey, Jordan, your last boss. Let's talk about your last boss you had before the current job you have. Um, so you remember when we went overseas in a return trip that somehow some other organization gave us our return trip home and we hit four continents on the way home. Do you remember what I'm talking about? We went from Africa to the Middle East uh, to uh, Europe and then finally back to North America. Would you rather... Um, spend the day doing a lot of uh, chores that uh, Megan is making you do that you don't like to do, or would you rather redo that trip again with the guy that was pissing and moaning like uh, Miss Daisy? What would you rather do, man? Oh man, that's a tough one. Because regardless, I'm 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 the you know public enemy number one. Whether I'm at home putting away the dishes in the wrong place, or or mowing the grass the wrong direction for the week it is, or if I'm on an airplane with you, uh, <laughs> traveling overseas to four different continents in in, uh, in one trip, ooh, that's a tough one, man. Uh, especially after a trip like that, I was pretty worn out. Um, I, you know, hey, Ron, I have to say, I felt so bad. I mean, first of all, this guy can kick my ass, you know, and uh, you know, in in eight different ways, you know, and probably with just two fingers. Just I said, but I mean, he should. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. But I was so, you know, I was smelled so bad because, you know, I was chewing his ass and it, it wasn't his fault that when we got to Paris, what did I do? He did. He, he bought me some beer. <laughs> like two beers, man. <laughs> hey, beer solved all the problems. I had I had no answer for me. There's one of the only times where I couldn't bullshit my way out of something because I was <laughs> in plane or you know, oh man, it was bad. It was bad. But it but you know, one of those things where I went back and I talked to my teammates and let them know what happened, and they're basically like better you than me. And now I'm wishing I would have done fight camp instead. So <laughs> oh man. Speaking of ass chewings, uh, that's a good one. I mean, I I, I can tell you, um I would not want to get my ass chewed by John Tro- John Wayne Troxel. So I, 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 I'm, I'm sure you can attest, Colton. Griff, what was the what was the 
biggest and best ass chewing that you had in your entire career? It might have been the time, and he was the former uh, RCO, Brandon Tegmeyer. Um, so oh, yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Brandon, yeah. So uh, we went to, he, was, uh, he was the chairman's XO. So yeah, I work on a daily basis, yeah. It, and so I run things pretty loose, right, most times. Like, as long as you're getting your job done, like, I, I'm really, I'm okay with most things. Like, just as long as you, you show up on time, you're in the right uniform, you're doing your job, I don't care. Um, and he was, I was in a, the first striker unit in the army. So it was a conventional unit, uh, before I went over to the regiment, before he went over to the regiment. Uh, but we went to the Yakima training center and they were doing all their maneuver stuff for live fire. And we had the fire support team out on a hill doing, um, uh, just, you know, we're just calling in artillery fire, doing our thing out there at the range. And I hadn't called and checked in, in like 18 hours or something like that. Cause we were just working and I didn't think of it. And then Brandon shows up and like drops the tailgate of his striker and calls me over. And here we are standing on top of this mountain in the middle of Yakima training center and on front of all my guys. And I'm standing at attention and he straight up dresses me down. Yeah. It was, it was a scene like uh, the sun's setting behind it. He's getting <laughs> after me. I felt like this big. Yeah. So I'd have to say the biggest ass chewing I ever got was from, from Brandon. Yeah. You know, he's kind of a, uh, he's kind of a, you know, introvert looking guy. You know, I spent my last overseas trip with the chairman. I spent a week with him and he was kind of a quiet guy and everything. So he can, the fangs can come out when they need to, I guess. Right. Man, when he flips that switch, you don't want to be anywhere near it. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, uh, Anthony Spadaro, uh, he, he said, join the club on ass chewing. Is there, is, is there something we should know there? Yeah, so Spuds, Anthony Spadaro, Colton knows him very well. Um, he was the former U.S. Indo-Pacific Command senior enlisted leader, recently retired Marine Sergeant Major. We'll probably have him on here somewhere down the road. But, uh, yeah, he's he got a little uh, scunion, too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ron, what do you think? We're down to like three minutes. Should we give our guests some parting words here before we sign off here? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I would just like to, to say for, for everyone, you know, listen to what these guys have to say. I mean, you have, you have some, 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 we have some excellent on here. They have some in, imperative information for you, not only in uh, transition, but in life, you know, I mean, when we're talking about transition, really it never ends because you're always transitioning to some sort of new level. Uh, and, um, you know, that's, that's my part of words is just, is just really kind of, you know, run back, check this video out again, share this thing, because the information, the gems that you're going to pull from this is something that you can, you know, it can help you for the lifetime. Hey, gentlemen, I just want to echo what Ron said. Thank you both for taking time out of your busy schedules and sharing your stories with us. Uh, truly inspirational, both of you. And I really appreciate you taking the time and, uh, go Hawks. Go Hawks. Right, go Hawks. Go Hawks, but Seahawks. Hey, <laughs> no, that's the Iowa Hawkeyes, brother. Got him. Got him. <laughs> All right, All Colton, right, we'll go to you and then Griff. We'll give it to you. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much for having me on the show. Uh, for anybody viewing right now, check me out and listen on Fight Company. Also, I own a gym in Northern Virginia. Uh, we have a lot of uh, the agencies around here, you know, uh, some law enforcement, military. If you guys want to come check out the gym, First class is on me. Come out, learn, learn how to, uh, you know, be a force multiplier in society. Check us out. Listen on Fight Company Virginia is the gym name and my clothing company. And Listen on Fight Company. Check us out on Facebook. If you guys need anything, hit me up on social media. I run all my social media accounts. So I really appreciate it, gentlemen. Sergeant Major, Ron, Griff, thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Awesome, Griff. brother. Yeah, I'd say it's like any guys here talking about transition. I think Ron hit it in the head. You're always transitioning. They say the average American has five careers, you know, as, as they get out. And when you get out of the Army, your first one may not be the one. But just keep trying. Keep transitioning. Keep pivoting. Keep working. And you're going to find the one that fits. It takes a while. You're going to be all right. Um, Ron, thanks for having me on the show. Sergeant Major, always awesome to see you and talk yeah, to you. Man. Looking forward to getting to know you more. Colton, dude, I'm looking, hoping we can uh, hang out here in the future and you whip my ass on the mat. A little bit here and uh, maybe i'll bring my daughter out she's a wrestler and have her have her uh, learn from you that'd be great that'd be great hey, when we get together the four of us we're going to turn ron on to some bush latte 
the nectar of the gods from Iowa, all right? Old, old style. Old style. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, old style old like. This night, man. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Ron, back to you. Thank you all I, for I tuning in. Bye, everybody. everybody. Ron, it's all yours, brother. Hey, hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, on behalf of uh, Veterans Landing Group, uh, our sponsors for this, you know, this is something that they put together, bring together so we can have amazing guests, amazing content, and uh, valuable information to share with you and all of your friends, family, any members of your unit, and other veterans that are out there. And uh, lastly, Colton, you and Keith Bach right now today, uh, who takes it? Oh, well, he, he's over in USASMA going through a Star Majors Academy, so – Sorry, Keith. I know you're busy doing your homework, so I'm going to have to whoop that ass right now. But <laughs> don't smoke me, Sorry, Major. No, uh, Keith Bach, amazing, amazing guy. I mean, the selfless kind of guy that could have been in the UFC if he wanted to be, but instead he wanted to be a Ranger leader. And now he's in the USAS and about to be a Sergeant Major. So I can't say enough great things about Keith Bach and guys like him who, uh, who blazed the path for me, not only in fighting, but also, uh, you know, as a non commissioned officer. Awesome. Awesome. Good stuff. Thanks, awesome. gentlemen. We appreciate y'all. Love y'all. Griff, my big, tall, yeah, vanilla, vanilla shot After Colton. it. Siak. Ranger. Love and Colton, you'll never get this title belt because the ending will be choreographed, and I will always win, all right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, and as we always say, stay strapped. strapped. Don't get clapped. Get clapped. <laughs> Boom. All right. Take care, guys. All right.